And if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Mr. Mullen. Thank you. The council met in closed session earlier at 3.30. There was no meeting on item one or item two on the agenda. With respect to item three, council met uh, to have a conference with its real property negotiator on the first item, one parcel of land, 3.5 acres, located at 3131 Oceanside Boulevard, negotiating parties, City of Oceanside and the Oceanside Unified School District. Under negotiations are price and terms for the city's acquisition of the real property. Item 3B was a conference with a real property negotiator involving a portion of El Corazon property um, comprising of a part of APN 1620821, negotiating party City of Oceanside and Sudbury Development Incorporated. Under negotiations are price and terms for the potential lease or sale of the property. Uh, there is no action under the Brown Act report on items 3A or 3B. Thank you. With that, we'll go to our consent calendar, which are items 5 through 11. Mr. Navarro. No public. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. We'll go to item 12, which, which is our general item, which is an introduction of an ordinance regarding issues and storage in the harbor. Ted, you're up. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Weiss, City Council members, Ted Chiffone, Harbor Manager. I am here tonight to introduce an ordinance uh, amending Chapter 29. Staff recommends the City Council recommend the introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 29 of the Oceanside City Code and modifying Section 29A.7, which will allow the use of floats to store a dinghy within a slip or at a permitted wet storage location. Currently, there's only three ways uh, individuals can store their dinghies. Uh, they can do it on their vessel, they can do it within the slip, or they can do it in a storage rack on the dock. Storage racks are at 100% capacity with a lengthy waiting list. So we're trying to provide an additional alternative for our slip renters. That's just a couple of examples of dinghies in the harbor. Currently, these are unpermitted locations, as well as the float that the one dinghy is using not allowed. So this amendment to the ordinance will allow for dinghies to be stored on a float in the water in permitted locations and within a slip, and the dinghy and float cannot create an obstacle for navigation. That concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions. Do we have any comments? No public on this item. Public? Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. And I did hear from a resident who's a slip owner, I think actually there were two people I'm recalling, um, who had some concerns because they've traditionally had their dinghy and some other uh, things um, right next in, in their slip, right next to their slip. Mm -hmm. And so the concern that I heard was, are we going to have strangers walking around here? And um, so I got a really good uh, response to that by members of the um, Harbor Beaches um, Advisory Committee, I was wondering, Ted, if you could um, also respond to that right now. Sure. Because it's part of inventory and making sure that whatever's out there that is um, not no longer being used or may, might have been abandoned to be able to get that and get things more organized and... Right, Council Member Sanchez. Um, currently, and it, prior to at least my time there, <coughs> outsiders were allowed to rent smaller spaces like that who could come onto the dock and access those. Going forward, we, have, we are only allowing current slip renters to be able to permit these particular spots. So the only people that are gonna be going onto the docks are individuals who have a permit with the harbor. We have all their information. So there won't be any outsiders right. that'll be accessing those areas. Right, thank you. Um, 
And I think uh, because of the times, there hasn't been a chance to really get the, all that education information out. Um, so I'm looking forward to that happening when we're more able to do so and calm everybody's fears. So I'm going to go ahead and move um, introduction. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor Feller. And the, um, I, I meant to ask earlier, so I wouldn't take up time here, but who owns the, the, the floats? Deputy Mayor um, Feller, the floats are provided by the slip renter, so that they own the floats. Um, okay. Sometimes they are floats that are purchased online, manufactured. Okay. Sometimes they're handmade. Um, but it is the individual slip renter that owns the boat. Okay, thank you. I'm second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. I need to uh, title the ordinance, Mayor. This is the introduction of an ordinance of the City of Oceanside amending Chapter 29A of the Oceanside City Code to allow the use of floats for dinghy storage within a slip and to regulate the storage of dinghies outside a permitted slip. Please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you. Mr. Navarro, we'll go to 15 on off agenda items. Do we have any speakers? We have no speakers that submitted requests to speak slips by the four o'clock PM deadline. And I'd also like to reiterate to the public that the city clerk's office does have a four o'clock PM deadline to submit speaker slips to the city council. No Not off for agenda one. items. None, none for this When meeting. was the last time we had that? I can't even think of one. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any general council member comments? Then the um, the turkey trot is virtual this year, and I uh, left the paper upstairs, so I do not remember what day it's on. Do you know Mr. Weiss or Deanna? Do you? Deputy Mayor, Council Members, the virtual turkey trot is actually a series of days. It's not a specific day. Registration is open right now online, and then people complete the trot virtually within a range of days. I don't know the exact date, um, but it's happening right now, and people should go online to register. It's November 14th through the 29th. So that's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Then we'll be adjourned Wait, until I, six o'clock. Can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I thought, Christopher, did you, were you, were you going to say something? No lights. Okay, my apologies. Um, this past week, I heard something. Uh, oh, I got a call from um, Wayne Godinay, and we heard that Tony Maieffa passed away. And uh, there was there's a, not a better person that you will ever meet, will ever have met. Tony, he had that Islander welcoming. Um, feel and sense and you know his hugs were uh, just wonderful uh, wonderful um, just left you with a really good feeling he worked really hard on the small and cultural celebration events as well as SOS and this is a big loss to our community um, someone who um, you know meant a lot to our community not not just to his family who was also you know I mean, he was young um, so just want to say um, um, my deepest condolences, our deepest condolences to his family and to our Samoan community. Thank you. And we will reconvene at 6 o'clock. In the Oceanside City Council and go to our 6 o'clock public hearing item, which is a series of actions regarding the Rio Walkwell project. And we will open the public hearing and start with disclosures. Applicant. Uh, as well as uh, several emails for and against. Applicant, the public, and staff. Uh, a brief with the applicant, staff, and we received a number of uh, emails and calls in regards to the project. Uh, emails, uh, public, uh, personal, and I also had an opportunity to review the comments um, for the um, uh, mitigated neg deck and the responses. Applicant, public staff. With that, Mr. Madera, you're up. That's not what you were wearing earlier today. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor Weiss and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Sergio Madera, and I'm a principal planner with the Plan Division and a project manager for the Rio Rockwell Project. I'm here tonight to present to you the applicant's request 
for a general plan amendment, zone amendment, tentative map, and development plan. Tonight, staff is asking that the City Council consider the real Rockwell project and adopt a resolution adopting the final mitigated negative declaration, adopt a resolution approving a general plan amendment uh, to change the land use designations of the project site from general commercial and single family residential detached to uh, medium density B residential uh, to introduce an ordinance re uh, pertaining to zone amendment to change the site's zoning from a single family residential and limited commercial to planned development. And finally, to uh, consider adoption of a resolution approving the tentative map and development plan for 104 unit residential development located at the northwest corner of Frizzy Road and Old Grove Road. This area provides a contextual location of the site within the city of Oceanside. Project site is located, it's outlined in red on the graphic on the screen. And it, you can see the Mission San Luis Rey. Let me, uh, you can see Mission San Luis Rey to the southwest of the project site. Uh, it's a low, the project site is located approximately 400 feet to the south of the southern levee of the San Luis Rey River. And you can see Highway 76 to the south and the commercial, the commercial uh, developments here at the Old Grove, I'm sorry, at Frizzy and uh, 76, and here at College in 76. As outlined in the staff report, the project site consists of two separate parcels Site A is, consists of a 1.86 acre parcel as identified in parcel one of parcel map 12918. This parcel map created the parcels which were eventually developed into the River Ranch project immediately to the south of the site. Site B consists of a 9.885 acres as currently owned by the city of Oceanside. The property was part of a larger acquisition made by the city in 1992 for the Army Corps of Engineers San Luis Rey River flood control project. In 2003, the city declared the property surplus and made it available via an RFP for development of housing at the site. The applicant and city entered into a, a purchase and sale agreement in May 2017 for the purposes of developing housing at the site. Some confusion has been created by the uh, inclusion of Site B's APN in a recorded restrictive covenant that is part of the Army Corps of Engineers San Luis Rey River Flood Control Project. The restrictive covenant encumbers a portion of the APN uh, as restricted property under the recorded covenant, the restrictive covenant, which is denoted by the hatchet in the graphic on the screen. The restricted lands designation is not applicable to Site B as depicted in the graphic above, which is exerted from the restrictive covenant. Some more confusion has stemmed from Site B's designation as a hardline preserve under the city's draft subarea plan. Under the draft plan, the hardline preserve was applied to the site without the benefit of a biological report. The site is identified as having disturbed lands and general vegetation mapping prepared as part of the sub-area plan effort and confirmed by a bi biological resource assessment report prepared for the project. Staff has removed the hardline preserve designation from approximately six acres of site B and transferred it to a city-owned site located near Rancho del Oro Drive, which will be discussed in a moment. The Hardline Preserve designation will be maintained on the portion of the site that will be improved with a 100-foot wide biological buffer and a habitat management plan and funding source for its maintenance in perpetuity will be prepared for the buffer areas out outlined in Mitigation Measure Bio 4 for the final mitigated negative declaration for the, the Rio Rockwell project. In an effort to preserve the overall acreage of Hardline Preserve in the draft subarea plan, planning staff worked with the property management section of the Public Works Department to identify suitable lands to serve as replacement Hardline Preserve. Property management staff identified the site near the near Rancho del Oro. The applicant commissioned a biological resource assessment of the highlighted portion of the property, which found that it contained sensitive habitat in the form of coastal sage scrub and hosts California gnat catchers. The site is also adjacent to other lands designated Hardline Preserve under the draft sub-area plan and is of higher biological value than Site B of, of the project site. The Rancho del Oro site will have a deed restriction placed on it as to further ensure it is maintained as Hardline Preserve designation. 
This requirement is outlined in condition of approval number 116 in the draft resolution included as attachment four to the staff report. So the, gra the next graphic depicts uh, surrounding land uses to the project site. Uh, again, the 11.54 acre site is located at the west side of Prezi Road and north of Old Grove Road. Surrounding land uses include restored habitat associated with the Army Corps of Engineers San Luis Rey River flood control project. To the south, there's a residential development known as River Ranch. To the east is a residential development known as River Point, and to the west is Nichols Elementary. The existing general plan designations of the site are single family uh, detached residential and general commercial. Uh, the applicant is proposing to change the land use to medium density B residential, uh, which allows development of up to uh, 15 units an acre. The applicant also proposes to change the zoning of the site from limited commercial and single family residential to planned development. Uh, one of the stated purposes of Article 17 is to encourage assembly of properties that might otherwise be developed in unrelated increments to the detriment of the surrounding neighborhood. It should be noted that under existing zoning, a total of 107 units could potentially be developed. The RS zoning district allows up to 5.9 dwelling units per acre and up to 29 dwelling units per acre could be allowed on the CL zone portion of the project site subject to approval of a mixed use development plan. The proposed planning, uh, the, post, the proposed plan development zoning is consistent with the development immediately, immediately south of the project site and other properties in the nearby vicinity. The proposed real Rockwell development plan will serve as the regulatory zoning document for the subjects for the project site. The real Rockwell plan development includes site and building design standards as well as development standards which are unique to the real Rockwell project. A copy of the plan development plan was included as attachment. Uh, Four, within attachment four to the staff report for reference. The site has been designed with two planning areas. Planning area one uh, consists of approximately eight acres and 52 story single family detached homes with lots ranging from 2,054 square feet to 4,011 square feet and averaging about 2,537 square feet. Planning area two consists of approximately three and a half acres and 54 three-story townhomes distributed over 10 separate buildings. Access to the site would be via three uh, driveways, one off of Frozy Road and two off of Old Grove Road. The access off of Frozy Road, Frozy Road would be a left in uh, heading north on Frozy Road and a right in, right out, you're heading south on Frozy Road. The two access points on Old Grove Road would be full access with full left and right turning movements allowed. Um, one of the unique things about this project and the tentative map is that it would result in two final maps. Uh, map A would consist of the 54 of one lot, well, maybe two lots because of some common open spaces and 54 uh, townhomes for condominium purpose. And map B would consist of the 50 single family detached homes and any common lots associated with common facilities included within the project. Four different floor plans. So going back to the different uh, home styles proposed for the project, four different floor plans ranging in size from 1,179 square feet to 1,700 square feet have been included in the townhome development. There are six different building types proposed and 10 buildings overall. Um, this provides architectural interest uh, and, ha and has been designed to provide both uh, horizontal and vertical movement as to not create a, a flat plane and higher quality architecture. Uh, there are three uh, single family home floor plans proposed for the project. Each will have, uh, they range in size from 1,745 square feet to 2,050 square feet and there's a uh, two different architectural themes for each of the proposed floor plans, again, to provide visual, visual interest uh, in the project. So the existing site consists primarily of disturbed lands as identified in, in this uh, plant communities map prepared for the project. Uh, the, the, beige hatch, the beige highlighting uh, identifies the 
the disturbed lands, while the pink highlight, highlighting uh, identifies uh, some sandbar willow thicket that's uh, scattered throughout the site. That, that combines, that totals about 0.76 acres of, of existing riparian habitat that's on site. As part of the project, uh, there will be a 100-foot biological buffer where 2.3 acres of mitigation lands will be planted um, and then transition of, of riparian habitat will be planted and then we'll transition to a more uh, upland, uh, native upland uh, plant palette. And it's depicted here on the northerly end. So this, this hatched area will be the mitigation portion of the site. So we'll be creating uh, 2.38 acres of, of habitat here and this will transition to a 30-foot wide a uh, fuel modification buffer and upland habitat adjacent to the development. So the development at the site will be 100 feet from existing uh, sensitive uh, habitat that's been created as part of the Army Corps of Engineers flood control project. Uh, parking at the site has been provided in the form of a number of a uh, variety of spaces. There's 55 guest spaces provided. Uh, there will be guest pockets located here on the multifamily portion of the site and there will be some on-street parking located here and here in the single family uh, 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 portion of the project site. It should be noted that the code requirement for guest parking in a project of this nature is 12 spaces and the applicant has provided 55 uh, guest parking spaces, so 43 more spaces than what's required by the zoning ordinance. The project has also been designed with some active open space areas for residents of the project site. Uh, these, this graphic depicts the two uh, uh, active open space areas. Uh, Central Park area will be located off the, the westerly, uh, I'm sorry, the easterly project driveway off of Old Grove Road. And then there will be this village green area located right at the, the project intersection of Old Grove and Frizee, which will include a, 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 a passive open space and a small dog park. Uh, there will be some amenities here on the Central Park portion, including walking paths, uh, bench niches, and a picnic barbecue area with lounge chairs, a fire pit, and barbecue counter. The next graphic depicts the, the proposed open space associated with the project. Approximately 5.27 acres of the project site uh, will be uh, preserved in common open space. And overall, the project is uh, providing 6.75 acres of total open space, which includes private yards. That's over half of the project site uh, being preserved in one form of open space or another. One of the project benefits is the installation of a roundabout at the project intersection of Old Grove Road and Frizee Road. Uh, the, the applicant will construct as part of its offsite improvements the roundabout. The project uh, has been conditioned by the traffic engineering section of the Public Works Department to construct a roundabout to improve traffic flow and safety in the area. The project intersection will continue to operate at a level of service A after implementation of the project. Uh, so the project site um, is comprised, as we previously mentioned, of 9.85 acres of city-owned land um, having been declared surplus property in 2003, Site B is subject to the requirements of Government Code Section 54233, which requires 15% of the units located on the surplus property to be reserved for lower income households. There are 68 units located on the 9.85 acres of Site B, as depicted in the graphic on the screen. The reservation requirement to satisfy the Surplus Land Act is 11 units when rounded up. Uh, this requirement is enforceable by the Affordable Housing Regulatory Agreement, which is required to be recorded against the property prior to issuance of any permits for the project. Conditions of approval uh, within the draft resolution specifically address compliance with the Sur Surplus Land Act. So we will be getting 11 affordable units of the 104 uh, total uh, to be reserved for uh, low-income households. So a mitigated negative declaration has been prepared uh, for the project. Um, the draft uh, MND was circulated for a 30-day public review period beginning on June 29th of 2020 and ending on July 29th, 2020. Uh, comments were received by the San Diego County Archaeological Society, the Rincon Band of Lucina Indians, Caltrans, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, 
and preserve, preserve Calavera and one local resident. Substantive CEQA related comments received concern proposed mitigation for project impacts to the 0.76 acres of scattered sandbar willow scrub and lack of requirement for habitat management plan associated with the on-site mitigation provided. The draft MND proposed mitigation for impacts to sandbar willow thicket at a one-to-one -one ratio and did not include a, a requirement for habitat management plan. The final MND has been updated to reflect the mitigation ratio of three to one as required by the draft sub-area plan for a total of 2.28 acres of riparian habitat being provided on site within the 100 foot wide biological buffer. Mitigation measure bio four has been updated to reflect that requirement for an HMP to be created and implemented for the biological buffer mitigation area being provided on site. On October 26th, the Planning Commission considered a recommendation to City Council and voted uh, in a five to one vote voted to uh, the, for the City Council to they recommend or they recommended approval of the project to the City Council with adoption of resolution number 2020 P32. So finally, staff recommends that the Council adopt the resolution adopting the, fin the final mitigated negative declaration, adopt the resolution approving the general plan amendment, introduce an ordinance uh, for the zone amendment and adopt the resolution approving the tentative map and development plan. That concludes my presentation and, my, and I'll be available for any comments that the council may have. Thank you. With that, uh, we will go to the applicant's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, his, um, Sergio, Sergio, you'll be doing the uh, slides? Yes, we'll advance the slides for you. Thank you, as, as the planning commission. Thank you, Sergio. First, I did want to um, give some very sincere and appreciative thank yous. Uh, Sergio Madera was uh, tasked with our project, and we're very fortunate that we've had him through the entire project because you know, those, those can change, and I'm very thankful to the city for that consistency. And that, and, and Sergio's just done a wonderful job and made us do a lot of things we probably didn't want to do. But uh, again, at the, at the end of the day, you say thank you for that. And Jeff Hunt and and um, Jonathan Jonathan Borrego definitely offered some good leadership when we had some issues that were sort of conflicting. And um, uh, Brian Thomas was great to work with on things. And Maple, your uh, water department uh, manager. So I want to thank some of the individuals that we had a chance to, to work with and 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 go through the process. So I'll, let me start off with the first slide with that. With, with that recognized? Are we on that? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm trying to get on to the. I can see myself, but not the slide. Oh, I can see I can see the slide there in the corner. I was hoping to have a larger on my screen, but I don't know how to operate this properly. Um, there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can, can I? This is the real Rockwell, and uh, kind of Norman Rockwell by the river. And if we could have the next slide, please. So from a historical perspective, we want to show just the development starting here in 1967, and we have the project area is circled. And to you, the left of the project area is the mobile home park that is still there. And the mission is down, uh, down to the left. We have another, the next slide, please. And this shows another view of the mission and just sort of the, the agriculture and the activity out here in the area. The next slide, please. Then 1989, you start to see, see some residential development on the, uh, the community to our right that's built, but not a lot of other, uh, other development. And then next slide, please. So here we see 2002, uh, a, a lot of lots and some framing, homes coming in, models being built, starting starting to take shape. Next slide, please. So this is the current condition that you've all seen. Um, next slide, please. I, I, wanna, I, I wanna move through these quickly if you've seen that. You've, you, you've seen the site plan. Okay, so here, this is the entrance. Um, uh, coming um, off of the roundabout. And this entrance jogged my memory that I neglected to also tell you that um, our architect 
Eric Van Witchell is available on the um, on the Zoom, as is our biologist Peter Carlson. If we, as we get to that topic, so this is the entrance. You can see it's it's set back maybe 80, 100 feet from the kind of the, the the point of the triangle there, and that gives a lot of movement to the uh, the building. And you just don't what you don't see is a lot of massing up on the street right in front of you. That's why I like I like how this layout is because when you when you turn left here on uh, on and staying on Old Grove, you will you know have more movement and it just doesn't it feels more open and it feels open, which I, I think is a great feeling for the community. The next slide, please. So that's what we were looking at, and Sergio talked about this part of the um, the amenities to to the community. The one here, the triangle, I call that the um, the kickball park. And because I had four kids and we played a lot of kickball in our cul-de-sac, and I could imagine a ball going through one of those uh, the, those those windows in the back. But I think it's a great place for kids. And the the gate around the perimeter is secure. There's no there's no um, uh, ability to get in and out um, except for fire. And then up to the right is the uh, dog park, which will be a huge amenity for uh, the uh, homeowners. That, that for for dogs, and I know that again, my dog loves lo loves his dog park. So we can go to the next slide, please. All right, we sh should we show pictures of that in the next slide, please. Great. So this is the entrance um, going eastbound on Old Grove, and you, and the, the kind of the main entrance to the the project is when when you make a left, you see the community park in front, and we'll show a uh, a highlight of, the, of that park now. And imagine you're just kind of going there, walking walking into the community, now you walk into the park here. And then next slide, please. So this is the, uh, we call the Central Park and it's actually quite quite large. I believe it's um, 15, 18,000 square feet. I know, I know it's, it's our largest one here. And we have lots of, uh, of amenities to bring the community together. Of course, now, you know, as we respect our social distancing and, and other etiquette. Um, so that's a, we're, we think this will be a great amenity again for the residents. Next slide. So now I'm going to take you kind of taking a look, vantage of, of this part of the of the project when you're inside when you're inside. So the the next slide, please. So imagine you're walking on the street, and you're walking northbound on the internal street, and uh, to your left, and you're walking. I'm sorry, eastbound, and to your left is the is the north, and all these homes on your left, those are all view homes that overlook the preserve and the buffer, and have a view of the mountains and some of the sunset view to the left. So we think that's, 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 that's gonna be a great a great benefit. The next slide, please. There we go, we have a little closer. I think the, our architect's listening. I think he did a great job. If you have any questions for him, uh, we'll let him talk. Our, our next slide, please. So this is now, imagine, imagine we're walking down to the West End here and we'll have another perspective of homes inside the West End. Next slide, please. So again, this is looking um, east and to your left are uh, are the homes. Again, th those are looking out to the north that have a view over the preserve. To your right is parking along the street, and then there is guest parking just up. You know, maybe looks like about 50 feet up is is uh, is, is guest parking, and uh, there's um, driveways here, garages, of course. Next slide, please. So I just want to give you a view, kind of looking up the the um, the homes that are on the bottom that you can see. Those are above the park. And the, the ones in the back that you can see there, there those are overlooked and preserved. Just to get a feeling, at, you know, at a, maybe a 500 feet. Next slide, please. You've seen these these beautiful new townhomes. The next slide, please. So uh, again, we, we we've seen the view here of the uh, of the uh, main entrance and the entrance off the roundabout. The next slide, please. Uh, I, I think we're good for now. If we can just turn off the slide, and we'll we'll save these for uh, if our um, our uh, if our biologist needs to come up. So that's a uh, uh, hopefully a short and sweet presentation on our on our project. There, that we're excited to have new families moving because this is about really providing housing to families and, and, and to those that, that are going to come home and really enjoy living there and love living there. Thank you. And you have just over 12 minutes left for rebuttal if you need it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And we'll go to the public.
On, uh, on this agenda item, we only have one speaker, and that speaker is Diane Nygaard, and we are getting her on right now. And Ms. Nygaard, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Diane Nygaard representing Preserve Calavera. We uh, certainly appreciate that a number of changes have been made to this project um, uh, since it started, and they certainly have improved it. Uh, I call your attention to the written comments that we submitted that provide some more, more detail about a few remaining concerns we have. But tonight, I just want to highlight one of those. And that is that over 20 years ago, Sandeg started the process to develop our regional conservation plans. The stakeholder group for that effort included the BIA, developers, and conservation groups. The goal was a plan that would work for everyone. The developers got certainty about where and how they could develop and expedited permits. Conservation community got certainty about the most important land and wildlife corridors would be protected. It was a win-win for everybody. And now here we are 20 years later and Oceanside still has not adopted their conservation plan. And even worse with this Rio Rockwell project, we are taking land that's been promised for all of that time, included as hardline preserve in that draft plan and putting 104 housing units on it. That really does not feel like a good faith effort to implement that plan. And so tonight, again, we ask you to direct staff to include adopting the sub area plan as part of our general plan update. Um, let's all work together and achieve that win-win that's been planned for over 20 years and actually see this get adopted. Thank you. That concludes the public comment on this item. We'll go back to the developer if you want to add anything in regards to rebuttal. If not, then we will move forward. No rebuttal. Thank you. I, I do I do appreciate the speaker's comments. Uh, and uh, we've, we have received comments that we've tr tried to work with and, and listen to. But there, there is no rebuttal. Thank you. With that, we will close the public input portion and come back to the city council. Uh, council Member Sanchez. Thank you. And Mr. Madera. You did begin your comments um, and your presentation addressing the issue of hardline, which was uh, the uh, topic of the um, um, the comments by the the uh, public um, by Ms. Nygaard, and uh, uh, you indicated that there may have been some kind of a, a misunderstanding or something when this was surveyed. And that there, there, um, that, and you pointed out to what would would have been hardline um, preservation, the intent to to, and hardline means no ifs, ands, or buts. Soft line, more of a um, negotiable, maybe some way of of addressing that, in that that would preserve the intent of it. So, can you? Uh, why, again, was do you think that there was this uh, misunderstanding? That's what I'm interpreting from your comments. Because my first question was, isn't wasn't isn't this is this hardline, um, which should have been preserved? And uh, uh, my understanding is no, it was it wasn't intended to be hardline. Only only um, this small portion that you outlined in purple. Council Member Sanchez, members of the City Council, um, to clarify the comments made, uh, there were there was some confusion am amongst commenters confusion. on the project throughout the beginning with the uh, public review period for the uh, initial study and mitigated de declaration that was prepared for the project. Um, there's the confusion lied with uh, the designation of Hardline Preserve at the site, uh, the inclusion of a portion of the uh, APN as part of the restrictive covenant associated with the Army Corps of Engineering project. So to clarify, uh, the site does have under the draft sub-area plan, again, which has not been adopted and has not gone through a full environmental review, 
uh, was designated as hardline preserved without the benefit of a biological study of the site. Uh, the site uh, the predominant, is predominantly disturbed land, uh, does not have any current value as habitat. Uh, there is 0.76 acres of sandbar willow thicket uh, uh, present at the site uh, that is being mitigated. Um, in order to preserve the integrity of the hardline preserve area that's included in the draft sub-area plan, uh, staff worked with uh, the, the staff of, of uh, the Public Works Department and, and property management uh, to identify a site that can we could transfer six acres of hardline preserve so the overall acreage as outlined in the draft air, sub area plan would not fall below that total. Um, the site will continue to have a hardline preserve designation on a portion of the site of the project. Um, the, the site that the, the portion buffer. of the project that's being improved with the 100 foot biological buffer, which includes 2.28 acres of mitigation land for impacts to that sandbar willow thicket. And so, uh, staff, this is not uh, something that's happened overnight. Staff has been working on this since 2016 with meetings with the uh, uh, California De uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We floated this idea to them. Uh, they were generally accepting of the idea. We did receive comments from. California Department of Fish and Wildlife on the draft mitigated negative declaration. Uh, the final mitigated de negative declaration reflects all response. Re there was response comments prepared for that. All the comments received from California De Fish Department of Fish and Wildlife. So in a nutshell, there was a hardline preserve designation associated with this site, but it was without the benefit of a, of a, of a biological survey. There, there was found to be a very small amount of of habitat on site, and that's, that small amount is being mitigated on site at a ratio of three to and, one. And to be very clear, it's not like uh, anyone has been mowing this area to change it from habitat to disturbed, right? Uh, that's, that's fairly accurate. I believe the city does probably annually mow it for weeds. Uh, there is no, again, no habitat present. It's uh, disturbed. There's existing utilities that were installed at the site many, many years ago. So How, it's, Let me ask you this question. How far back does the city um, have a record that it has been disturbed? Would you say it was, it, it showed that in, say, around 2000 when, when the, uh, the uh, committee was still meeting? I think it was disturbed, uh, Council Member Sanchez, members of the City Council. I believe the aerial imagery shown uh, in the applicant's presentation shows it disturbed at least until 19, you know, prior to 1989. Right. Um, we don't have, I, that's not a record that we um, delved very deeply into. We kind of went on the current uh, ex right. existing conditions when we assessed the project. And I do want to comment here that I, when I became a council member, I was able to serve on the committee um, for the Siberia plan. It was uh, it was um, winding down, um, and there were members. Um, I think more than half of the members were um, members from the BIA, um, and then there were um, members from, say, the wildlife agencies and other others interested in preservation. Um, Another question, uh, there were some comments that included from the wildlife agencies that recommended uh, signage and perhaps even a wall of some kind to ensure that there would not be uh, dogs going back there, people going back there trampling on, uh, on this, on this pre preserve. Uh, was that, I didn't see that it was, a, that part of it was addressed. The signage, yes, but what about how, how, how what was, uh, what the developer agreed to do with respect to um, showing a, you know, a wall or whatever? Sure. Council Member Sanchez, members of the City Council, the project plans have always included a six foot masonry concrete block wall to separate okay. the buffer area from development. There will be an access gate because there is some underground water storage uh, stormwater storage facilities that will be located that require uh, uh, regular maintenance. There also uh, it will also provide access for maintenance of the um, biological uh, the planting areas until it meets its success criteria. So there's limited access only by 
um, uh, those authorized by the HOA uh, in the future management entity of that biological area will be available to access that site. Um, is staff uh, satisfied that there will be a permanent funding source for the HMP, uh, the, the um, Habitat Management Plan? Uh, Council Member Sanchez, members of the City Council, uh, the project has a mitigation measure which requires that a funding source be identified and the Habitat Management be Is that uh, to the satisfaction of, of staff? Uh, we have yet to see that. We will okay. see that what we, uh, prior to final engineering and prior to uh, permits being issued for the project site. Uh, it's a fairly normal thing. You wouldn't want to engage in that, uh, that process right. prior to having an entitled project. Okay. And as to the affordable, um, the 11 units, uh, which are, was that the, the B? I'm, I'm trying to remember, was that the B or the A? I forget. The B? Will be, um, let me go to the- track. It's not the townhouses, it's the other portion. I forget the A and B. <laughs> but anyway, um, will they look the same as the other units? Will they have be, it's, will it be the same quality? Uh, Council Member Sanchez, member of the City Council, yes. Uh, the, within the framework of the regulatory affordable housing agreement, there's a requirement that the houses uh, look similar in nature, so they will be concentrated in the townhome, townhome portion of the project the site right? for uh, financial oh. viability of the project. Um, uh, the, the project is conditioned to pay the in-lieu fee for the single-family component of the project. Um, and they will be in, uh, indiscernible from any other of the market rate projects. So be, you can't tell the difference between the affordable units or the market rate units. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, I think that's, the, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. So I have a, a question, and maybe it's geared more toward the applicant. I know you're doing 11 um, of the low-income affordable units, but our arena numbers and where we're lacking is in what I would call workforce housing, which would be in the more moderate affordable levels. And in looking at your project, it would appear, uh, at least to me, that that might meet that criteria mm -hmm. and would like your input on that if you see that moderate affordability criteria being met for some of the 104 units. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, we do see that. When we were running our numbers with um, uh, mortgage bankers and others that are that specialize in selling and financing these types of units, uh, we, we noticed exactly that the, the market rate homes are affordable in that income range that you just stated. So, that, so that's a, another good positive. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. <clears throat> Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so just want to get this straight r really quick. So in 2003, the city moved on this as a surplus land, disposed of it. And the purpose of disposing of it, the purpose of selling it was, from your staff report, was giving staff direction to dispose of the property for the purpose of developing houses at the site. Is that correct? Council Member Rodriguez, that's correct. Okay. Uh, previous... Uh, items came to this body, and that was the direction given by council. Perfect. And so here we are, many years later, and we finally have a, a plan to build some housing and and meet the lack of inventory that we have uh, within our city and our region. Um, I had one more question. Actually, it's more of a comment. Um, we get a lot of uh, comments from the public with different developments on, you know, ones like this that need, you know, they need a zoning change uh, because our general plan is, is outdated. And 35 years ago, they thought you could put a commercial spot here and we look at it today and it's like, no way, no, you know, and that's why nothing's went there. So we have to update our general plan. And so we're in an important season where we're beginning to update that plan and, um, things like this can be, you know, hopefully prevented and we give a lot more certainty and stability to the community. So I look forward to moving full speed ahead on that general plan update and um, I have no further questions. Mayor Feller. Thank you. Um, is, is this raised up out of the flood plain? Uh, Deputy out Mayor. Flood plain. 
Well, Deputy Mayor Phillip, a portion of the project site lies within the floodplain. Phil will have to be brought in to raise that base flood elevation out of the floodplain. Um, the applicants already applied for a Clomer F with the Army Corps, I'm sorry, with uh, FEMA to, to begin that process, the documentation process. So it, when it's completed, it will be out of it, is that? Deputy Mayor Phil, that's correct. Once the project is completed, we'll be outside of above the base flood elevation. So the piece of property that we owned uh, is the long, narrow one. And it, what is that? Is that about 300 feet wide? I'm not sure about the width. I'd have to check the, the plans. It's about 10 acres in, in area. Yeah. It, and and I'm, I'm guessing we're uh, giving up somewhere around a, a third of that for habitat uh, of, of that whole project. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that um, uh, a third of a lot of land is, is not enough. It's not ever enough. Um, and and I, you don't have to agree with me or not. It, it's just the way it is here. Um, you know, people have come here from San Francisco and other places, live on the edge of uh, the city. Gray, we graded thousands of acres, or hundreds and hundreds of acres in habitat uh, earlier in the um, history of this city. And, uh, and now that they've got theirs and come here, they don't want anybody else to Ha have the uh, the um, ability to to live uh, like they do. So um, I think this will protect the habitat better than it has been in the past uh, because it's it's a barrier. People just let their dogs run out there. They ride in go karts out there. When we turned a, a commercial piece into something that's really going to be exciting for the community and uh, the the arena numbers, these this is absolutely in a workforce housing type market. I think, and that's going to be perfect for uh, Oceanside. Um, we need we need the housing, um, and you know you need the update but we need the housing in the meantime. So uh, I move approval. Thank you, and I would like to clarify the two projects to the south of this one, River Ranch North and River Ranch South, were properties that the city sold. So we have a motion and a second, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, you have a series of resolutions to approve the entitlements, but I also need to title the ordinance uh, for the rezone. This is the introduction of an ordinance of the city of Oceanside amending the zoning designation for certain real property located at the northwest corner of Frizee Road and Old Grove Road from limited commercial and single family residential to planned development, Rio Rockwell zone amendment. Please vote. Motion approved, 5 0. And with that, we will adjourn to 3 30 on Wednesday, December 2nd.